$1,175. So if you can help us reach $1,500, that would be wonderful. We would appreciate it. Thank you. Almost there. And one final announcement. I don't see uh, Greg or Blake here today. Uh, so uh, they are doing their, uh, their mentor project for food shelf donations. We're almost there for monetary donations, so thank you very much. We're, we're almost to our $2,000 goal. Uh, we're a little, little behind on our uh, pounds of food. Here's a little tip. Buy canned goods. That will bring the poundage up. And canned goods can go quickly, so buy, buy some canned goods and uh, let's fill up that cart out there. Are there any other announcements? We'll take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. For a suffering church at Rome, the chief sign of the Spirit's work among them was not their capabilities, membership numbers, or money, but their cries to God for help. The congregation may please stand. Our call to worship is from Psalms 139, verses 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in chill, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. We confess our sins before God and one another. God of resurrection, you have redeemed us through the gift of your Son, yet we often act as though we don't know what that means. We fail to see where we need to change, where we need to work to bring positive change to the world. We remain fixated on ourselves rather than living in love and service for others. Forgive us our sins of thought word and action or lack of action that we might better do your will 
Christ is risen indeed and proclaims to you and all of creation the entire forgiveness of sin. Receive this gift of forgiveness with joy. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Also with you. Let us pray. Great Spirit, you have lit upon each of us a flame to serve you in all that we do. Ignite your flame and help us to burn brightly for you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture text from today is Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 39. And this is also one of my favorites. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. And when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if we in fact suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers together in the pains of labor. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what one already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And God, who searches hearts, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? 
It is Christ who died, or rather who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. Jesus said, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Children may come forward. It's you, it's you, fill us with your love, show us how to Well done. Can you hear me? Okay. I think you've heard it said a couple of times. What is today? Pentecost. You know, when I was your age, I was taught in church that Pentecost was one of four high priestly days. Do you know what that means? I didn't think it. I bet you your parents don't know it either. Huh? Do any of you know that in the church year, there are four Sundays that are greater than others? The first two deal with Jesus. What, are the, what do you think the two most important days for Jesus are? Ah, oh, you hit it right on the head. Christmas and Easter. Jesus' birth and his resurrection from the grave, right? And usually the church is all full then, right? Hopefully. The second, the last two deal with the church. You want to take any wild guesses what those two days are? Pentecost, which is very good because that is the birth of the church. Now, when we talk about the church here, we're talking about all the people who believe in God rather than Shalom Lutheran. Shalom Lutheran is the congregation. It's one small part of the church. Now, I doubt if any of you 
We'll think of the second high priestly day. It deals with resurrection. Not Palm Sunday. Most of you, and I bet out if your parents would think of it, it's All Saints Sunday. When we talk about people rising from the dead and going to heaven. Those are the four. But today is Pentecost. And I'm going to read you a lesson that when I was growing up was always read on Pentecost. It's from the second chapter of the book of Acts. And I'm, it's supposed to be 21 verses, but I'm only going to read the first five verses. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. In divided tongues, as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. I brought with me in my pocket, if I can get it out, a balloon. It's a pretty balloon. But is this balloon really fulfilling its purpose? No. Why? It's not blowing up. Well, I think of this like the church. Back after Jesus had risen into heaven, and on, that was on Ascension Day, we call that. And on that day, he said that he would send the Holy Spirit to be with his followers. And they would fulfill his purpose here on earth. You already said that this balloon doesn't. Well, after Ascension Day, the disciples, the 12 disciples, actually were 11 disciples at that time, were up in the upper room where they had had communion. And they were worried. The doors were locked, and they were afraid that the soldiers would come and arrest them. Jesus had promised that he would be with them for the Holy Spirit. There. Does that fulfill the purpose of the balloon? Yes or no? Yes? This is a big round balloon. And I always had fun with balloons, round ones especially, because you could bat them and play kick with them and all kinds of stuff. Is this big enough to bat back and forth? No. Well, is this like the church? Well, Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit. Does this fulfill the purpose of the balloon? Is it big? No. Did you listen to that lesson or that I read? The guys were all sitting, they were in the upper room, and something happened. There was a loud, rushing wind. What's wind? Air that blows. Oh, well done. When you were born, did your mother tell you that when you were born, they probably spanked you on the butt once real quick. Huh? Not spanked you, but hit you on the butt. Why was that? To clear out your throat so you would have air. So you would be alive. Well, that's what Jesus said. Or what happened on Pentecost? The loud rushing wind was air, life coming to the disciples. And then something else happened. The followers of Jesus were called disciples. In a way, each of you 
are disciples of Jesus. Sometimes I give out candy here, right? Do you remember me giving out candy? And what do I tell you when I give out candy? To share it and tell people what? Jesus. Right. You, and why I do that is I'm telling you to be disciples. Oops, look at my thing. Uh, that by being a disciple, you're to tell others how much Jesus loves you. And Jesus told his disciples to tell others about Jesus. That's what a disciple does. But something else happened on Pentecost. Something came and did what? Oh, you jumped ahead, but that's close. Yes. Tongues as of fire. Now, that sounds weird. Have you ever had fire land on your heads? No, I don't think so. But in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, fire represented someone else. Fire, Abraham, when he was offering up his son Isaac, a flame of fire, a burning bush, came and told him not to sacrifice uh, Isaac, but it was God speaking to him. Or better known in the story of Moses, Moses, when he was a shepherd, had saw a burning bush, and it told him to go back to Egypt and save his people. Fire was the symbol for God. Is this a full balloon? No! You think it could be bigger? Whoa! So, the disciples got new life, some air, and God came and descended upon them on their heads. Now I'm going to need air. And what happened? What were the disciples to do? Go, you had it. Go and tell people about God and how much God loves them in Jesus. And that's all the Pentecost story. That each of you has been called. You've been given new life because of Jesus. God has come upon you. And you have become his child. And he dwells in you. And your job is to tell others about Jesus and what he has done for you. That indeed you are God's children. Now, I have some balloons in my pocket. I'll give each of one to you. I think these are neat for Memorial Day, too. Have bigger ones. But I'll give each of you one of these. Want a blue one? Somebody? Okay, I've got blue and red. Yeah, here you go. There you go. Uh oh. I think you need your mom to help you with it, or dad to help you with that one. Don't want you to choke. But stay a second because I have some balloons, also balloons to hand out. If you want to come up, please. Yeah. Okay, everybody, you, you're going to get a blown up balloon. And. Aha! Uh -huh, there's a couple of kids that didn't come up. When you, when you look at this balloon, what are they in the shape of? Hearts. Hearts? I want you to think about how much God loves you. Here, right here, we need one. Now, I know that there's some people out there who are young at heart. We'll give you what's left, okay? Thank you. Uh, oh, now we're all mixed up.
Have a good day and a good Pentecost. And it's time for the noisy offering. So you just went back to your seats, but you need to come back now. Be careful. And as always, our noisy offering benefits our youth ministry here. You can go around multiple times. I'm just fine. <laughs> oh, we got another one here. In March, the New York Times published an article titled, What's Behind the Middle-Aged Groan? Apparently, and I can attest to this, and many of you can too, I'm sure, as we get older, we tend to groan more when we change elevation. You want to pick up something? Ah! You know, we, we get up from our chair, ah! Oh! Sitting, standing, getting up, bending out of pain or stiffness or the need to exert a little more, like Sam did last week at the children's sermon, uh, we, uh, we, we just need to exert a little more than we used to. And there are several videos out there of toddlers imitating their parents' groans. So here's one of them, I hope. No, no. <laughs> There's nothing like getting roasted by a toddler. <laughs> Sometimes groans aren't in response to exertion, though. They're in, in response to anguish, suffering, grief, or despair. When we cry, we often groan, too. When we're asked to articulate something, when we're feeling something really deeply, sometimes all that can come out is a grunt or a groan. We may groan inwardly at the state of our world, of our nation, our communities, our families, or ourselves. Or when our own toddler isn't behaving, we may groan. Not just for the thing, we may groan when we experience regret, not just for the things we did, 
but also for the things that we didn't do. Members of the Church of Rome may have been groaning too. While there hadn't been a definitive split between Judaism and Christianity at the time Paul wrote his letter, there was significant conflict. We know from New Testament and Roman sources that Christian teaching often provoked disturbances and riots. Surely, many families ruptured over the gospel just as Jesus had said they would. And as we all know, family fights are the worst fights. Nothing can tear one's heart and soul like a family fight. In addition, Gentiles were attracted to the new Christian movement, which raised serious concerns for Jews about their Jewishness. In the Roman world, for, that, for their part, the idea of worshiping a crucified God was considered laughable. And when we, identity was at stake, who are you? What do you believe? What do you stand on? And when we feel under threat, questions of identity become more and more polarizing and rigid. They become either this or that, one or the other. So Paul is writing to a church that seems to be struggling with what it has been called to be. There is internal division, for sure. There is growing hostility from Roman authorities. And the church remains pretty small. If you wanted to find a great influential church, the church at Rome was not it. Not in 57 AD. There was no coffee bar. There was no basketball court. No plethora of programs and clubs and studies. Members met in each other's homes. They weren't among Rome's movers and shakers. Some may have been wondering if this Christian movement would endure if Jesus was really coming back, or if it were destined for history's trash heap, along with countless other religious movements before it. So, what does greatness look like to a suffering church? What is the sign of God's grace in a suffering church? Greatness doesn't depend on numbers. It doesn't depend on programming or staff or the money in the bank. It doesn't depend on the number of families. And it sure doesn't depend on whether or not there's a coffee bar with a barista in the narthex. You know what greatness depends on? It depends on God's children crying out to God for help, especially in their deepest moments of suffering. That's greatness. That is the sign of God's greatest grace when we cry out to God when we are hurting. You see, when we suffer, when we groan, when we feel abandoned, even when we can't articulate a word to God, God's Spirit is at hand. God's Spirit is close by. Even when we don't feel anything, when we are numb, God's Spirit is at hand. God's Spirit groans with us with sighs too deep for words. Even a prayer doesn't depend a whit on our natural capabilities. When it comes to prayer, we're all incompetent. Even the best prayer among us. That's a good thing, by the way. If everyone is bad at something, naturally, what do we have to worry about? What do we have to fear? People often don't like to do something because they're afraid they'll look stupid. We don't have to worry about that with prayer. And if the Spirit has blessed someone with the gift of putting words together, how could that possibly reflect negatively on us and what the Spirit has given us? Whether we can string two words together or not, 
It is the Spirit that prays through us. This is the same Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters of chaos at creation, bringing life when there was nothing. This is the same Spirit that filled the first human's lungs, that hurled back the waters at the sea, that led the children of Israel through the desert, who covered Sinai with smoke and fire, who descended upon kings and prophets, who led Israel back from exile, who settled upon Jesus at his baptism and descended upon the church at Pentecost. Very same spirit. The very same spirit who did these mighty things is the same spirit who moves through our prayers today, turning our fumbling, clumsy words into glorious petitions worthy of God's hearing. Even if we only manage to eke out Father, that is the Spirit's work, reminding us that we are God's beloved children. And the Spirit does more than this, something even greater. Paul writes something that at first glance seems laughable. It doesn't seem to be true on the surface of it. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That's quite a thing to write. He can't possibly mean that everything will always turn out well, or that the faithful will always prosper, or that we'll never suffer. Paul himself suffered a great deal. Everything hasn't always worked out for him. Paul's own mission work, he caused conflict wherever he went. You can get more detail about that in the book of Acts. And in Acts and in the second letter to the Corinthians, we also get a glimpse of his deep, deep personal flaws. Paul knew what it meant to fail. But he still writes that all things work together for good for the one who loves God. So what does he mean? Perhaps it means even and especially our failures are used by God for God's purposes of bringing shalom to the world. Even our failures are used by God to bring God's shalom to the world. Perhaps especially our failures. After all, Jesus' career as Messiah ended in failure. There's no polite way to put it. He was executed on a Roman cross as a threat to public order. Yet God raised this failed Messiah up as our Lord, Judge, and King. In his life, death, and resurrection, God's Spirit brought life where there was only death. God's Spirit brought love where there was only hatred. And God's Spirit brought forgiveness where there was only sin. That's what God's greatness looks like. That's what God's grace looks like. And that's what God's love looks like. Nothing can separate us from God's love, folks. Nothing. Not even ourselves. The spirit of peace which Jesus talks about in our gospel reading will keep us rooted in the love of God by keeping us in the truth, even and especially in our sufferings. In our pain, weakness, and failure lies greatness and grace. Because in those things we learn that God's Spirit is moving through us, groaning through us. God will never abandon us. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we often don't know how to pray. We don't know what to say, or we fear how we might sound. We are also anxious, anxious about being good enough or clever enough or capable enough, We also have anxieties about the state of the world and wonder whether there is any redemption for it and for us. But in your spirit, you have given us a sure and certain hope in Jesus Christ. Send that spirit always to work through our prayers, 
keep us rooted in the truth and to remind us of your love. Help us to be open to the Spirit's work among us so that we may grow into the redeemed people you have already declared us to be. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
we confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Suffered on the third day, on the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. A standing in all of your unfathomable grace, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy Spirit, fill your church with new life and kindle within it the flame of the gospel. Where there is brokenness, help us bring shalom. Where there is groaning and pain, help us bring reconciliation and healing. We especially pray for the Northwestern Minnesota Synod of the ELCA, our Companion Synod, the Andre Evangelical Lutheran Church in India, for our bishops, Elizabeth and Bill, for our staff, David, Sam, and Jerry, and for our Congregation Council, Brian, Carol, Kim, Arnie, Amber, Emily, and Corey. Send your spirit upon them as they work for your kingdom. God of life. All creation groans in labor pains for the coming of the day when it will be set free from its bondage to decay. Make us instruments of liberation for all that you have made, that the natural world might continue to sustain us all. God of life. Give our leaders the ability to understand and be understood, regardless of language or cultural differences, that they might move us toward harmony with our neighbors near and far. We pray for all peoples suffering from the actions of the powerful, especially in Ukraine and Russia. God of life, hear our prayer. Nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. Out of that love, bring to health and wholeness all who are in need of your healing touch, especially Skip and Lisa, Phyllis, Mike, Lisa and family, Michelle, John and Carrie, Bob, Dave and Mary, Jerry, Jeanette, Arnie and Kay, John, James, Avis, CJ, Kay, Jennifer, Bonnie, Sandy, D, 
Dave, Carol, those who suffer from trauma, abuse, or violence, and those we name you before, and those we name before you now, silently or aloud. Merciful God, hear our prayer. With humility and gratitude, we remember all who have lost their lives in service to their countries. Remember them in your kingdom and restore healing and hope to their families. God of life, we bring other intercessions to you now, silently or aloud. God of life, we lift up all the saints who have gone before us, knowing that not even death can separate them for us. From your love, hold and keep them in your loving embrace until we can again see them in the flesh. God of life, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers and those which remain unspoken in the name of Jesus, our high priest. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. I just want to lift up the ministry of prayers and squares for a moment. Uh, mission is not just what we give, but it is also what we do. And I just, I think that the prayers and squares, with the, especially with the quilt last week for Avis, that is such a powerful ministry. So the way we, we give of ourselves is, it, can uh, can be monetary, but it doesn't just have to be that. God wants our whole selves. So, uh, walk in love as Christ loved us, who gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. sisters it was good for my brothers and sisters it was good for my brothers and sisters and it's good enough for me give me that old time religion give me that old time religion give me that old time religion cause it's good enough for me it's good enough for me. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Up on the mountain, my Lord spoke. Out of his mouth came fire and smoke. Down in the valley, on my knees, I asked my Lord, have mercy, please. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. But one train on this track It runs to heaven and runs right back St. Peter's waiting at the gate Says, come on sinner, don't be late Every time I feel the Spirit in my heart Moving me, moving me to pray Every time I feel the Spirit in my heart I will pray 
owe to your generosity, O God. Receive these gifts we offer and use them to benefit your children in need, whoever and wherever they may be in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of surprises, your spirit brooded over the waters at creation and lived among your chosen people in wilderness, exile, and promised land. Your spirit filled Mary's womb at the moment of Jesus' conception and came upon him like a dove at his baptism. When Christ died on the cross, your power raised him from the tomb on the third day, and that same evening he breathed your forgiving grace on those who had deserted him. On the day of Pentecost, you sent your spirit among the fearful dis disciples, filling them with fire, with power, with wonder and joy, and making them your church. And so we gladly thank you with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending praise. God of comfort and strength, we look to your Holy Spirit to be with us in sorrow and in com contentment, in crisis and in abiding stillness. Come now among us through the power of your Spirit, that we may be transformed in your image, and that these gifts of bread and wine may become for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, who at supper with his disciples took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave you thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God of dreams and prophecy, send down upon us your gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and faith, of healing, discernment, and interpretation, that your church may be built up in the likeness of your Son. Let anyone who is hungry find in you the bread of life, and anyone who is thirsty find in you rivers of living water, Speak your word to all who are alone and in fear or despair, and let each one of your children hear your voice in their own language, whether that language be art or science, work or play. Sanctify your groaning creation that your universe may breathe your breath and be filled with your life anew, that we may love what you love and do what you would do. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, ever one God. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. See 
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your hand and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The God of all who raised Jesus from the dead, bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen. Amen. to invite people into a deeper relationship with Christ so that all may discover true peace and be prepared to follow him in compassionate service. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.